Our scripture for today, <clears throat> the first Sunday of Christmas time, is from Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 41, reading through verse 52. Hear God's word. Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's like a whole sermon I want to preach but I'm not going to on the fact that Jesus was in Jerusalem by himself for three days and he was just fine. So there's a whole sermon about what does it mean to be the church where the adults in Jerusalem, just somebody took care of him and made sure he had a place to stay and food to eat. Isn't that profound? But I'm not going to preach that sermon today. All right. Uh, so this account works on two levels. To me, this works on the, first of all, the obvious human level is on the level of the parents who lose their child. Has any parent ever lost their child before? Anyone so brave to admit that? We, we were walking home from here recently, uh, had all the girls, we we're walking to the car and we kind of looked at each other and said, where's Dax? And because he just kind of gets passed around like, oh, I guess we should get him. So we had to go find who had Dax. I think Andy Sparrow had him. I'm not sure. But, um, you know, it. You know that these things can happen, but, um, you know, they travel for a whole day thinking he's with his cousins or something, and then they discover he's gone, and they look for him. So by the time they get back, it's three whole days, which if you're a parent or if you've ever been a parent, you know, that's just terrifying and awful. And so on the one level, you have this question that Mary and Joseph ask. I think Mary is the one who actually asks it, uh, who says, why have you treated us this way? Like, what are you doing? Why did you do this to us? Why have you treated us this way? Don't you see how worried, how stressed, how afraid we have been? So it works on that one level. But it also, in my opinion, works on a spiritual level. And that's on the perspective of Christ. Jesus is God in the flesh, God incarnate, right? And so he's different. And what does it say he was doing in the temple? What does it literally say? He was in the temple with the other teachers, with the rabbis. He is with the teachers of the law and he's asking them questions. Now, that's how you learn is by asking good questions. I love it when people, in fact, on Christmas Day, I got a text message from a church member who said, hey, a few weeks ago, you said something like this in a sermon, and I got a question. Don't have to answer me today, but I love that kind of thing, because that means, see, my, I don't think a sermon should be the answer, me personally. In fact, I think sometimes the sermon is just a conversation starter. Because what the Holy Spirit wants to work in you and in me, and sometimes the best sermons are one where we have to think about it for days or even weeks, I, I can think of sermons that I've heard where I had questions. 
in the, in the Jewish rabbinical tradition, that's how you teach. You teach by asking questions. And if you will read the, I said, t- told you a couple weeks ago, I want everyone to read the Gospels, right? I hope you will read the, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you're a Christian, I think you should read the Gospels regularly. If you're going to be a disciple of our Rabbi Jesus, you have to learn his way of life. And I don't know how else to do that it, it, apart from actually reading or listening to on Audible or something like that, the scriptures read out loud. If you'll read the Gospels, notice this. Notice how many times Jesus answers a question with a question. And, and see, what that's, that's, that's a particularly Jewish way of teaching. The great rabbis would, would often not give you the answer, but they would answer a question with a question. So, for instance, one day Jesus was asked, uh, you know, hey, it says love God and love neighbor, but who exactly is my neighbor? And so then Jesus tells a nice parable called the Good Samaritan, which you've all heard. And then it ends with a question. So he's asked a question, who, who is my neighbor? He tells a parable, and then what's the question that ends it? Which one was a neighbor to the man? All right, so he asks a question. He answers the question with a question. And so which one was a neighbor? The Samaritan, right? It's it's not a squirrel. The Samaritan, (laughs) the Samaritan is the answer. Now, what was the prior question? Who's my neighbor? So Jesus tells a story and he asks a question. The answer to that question is the Samaritan, which see how that's a, that's a, he could have just said, who's my neighbor? The people you hate. That's your neighbor. But instead, he said this provocative story that ends in a question. Are y'all tracking with this? No, I mean, this is just one example. There are loads of examples like this in the scripture where Jesus answers a question with a question because he wants us to actually learn. He wants us to grow. He doesn't want to just hand it to us. He wants us to to make it our own and, and grow up into disciples of him. Now, I think he's actually doing that at age 12 in the temple. It says he was with the teachers asking them questions. In other words, he's teaching them. He's not just learning from them. He's asking questions back. That's that's growth in the rabbinical school, right? So Mary's question to Jesus is, why did you treat us this way? What is Jesus' question in response? Why were you searching for me? Hmm. Interesting, right? Why were you searching for... I mean, this is... (laughs) And on the human level, like any parent would go, because you're our kid, and we... You know, it's like, it's it's a dumb question on the human level. It's a profound question on the spiritual level. I think that's the whole... To me, it's the whole deal is that Jesus asks, yes, his earthly parents, but he, asked, he would ask this of anybody, I believe. Like, why, 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 are you, why are you treating me this way? God, why are you treating me this way? Why were you searching for me? Why were you searching for me? Like we want to go, because you were missing Because we're your parents, because we love you. But from Jesus' perspective, why were you searching for me? What's the answer? Why were you searching for me? Because you wandered away from me. And then he reiterates it. Didn't you know that I would be in the temple? Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house. Do you see how this works on that deep level? Why were you searching for me? Because you actually put distance in between you and me. I didn't, I didn't move. That's a joke, but I, I got to tell like the, you know, the, the couple riding down the road in the old pickup and they've been married a while and the, the wife You know, kind of grumpy one day says to the husband, you know, what happened to us? I remember when you used to have me sit over there beside you 
in the middle seat and we'd be all close. Now I sit all the way over here and the husband said, I'm not the one that moved. <laughs> right? And there's a little bit of that, right? There's a little bit of that sometimes. It's like when we're going, where is God? Maybe we're the one that moved. Maybe God didn't abandon us. Maybe we have simply wandered a bit. We end up searching for Jesus because we're the ones who are lost. And to be with Jesus is to be in the presence of the Father and to be in the temple or in the Father's house. Christ invites you and me, Christ invites you and me to be in the temple, to be in the Father's house, to be at home with God, Emmanuel, God with us, right? And so we are invited to make our home with God. The, the, the sermon title today is Feels Like Home to Me, which is one of my favorite songs. I can never remember who sings it. It feels like home to me. You know that little song? Uh, I don't, it's in one of these sweet movies that we love. I, I can't remember. It's in some movie that I enjoy, but I can't remember. But um, there's just something special about being home, right? Feels like home to me. And, and so that's what God invites us to, is to make our home with him, to be in the temple. Contemplative prayer, contemplate. The word contemplate literally means in contemple, in the temple. We call this the, the temple, right? So this is this dwelling space where we, wanna, we want to contemplate God, we want to abide with him, to be with him. And so even if you came to Christmas Eve worship, even if you came to worship or worshiping online on the last Sunday of the year, on Sunday, December 26th, it's still possible for us to wander <laughs> even before January 1st. It's possible for us to wander away from making our home with Christ. I mean, where had Jesus and his parents just been? Passover. Like, the, I don't know if you know, but that's kind of a big deal. You know, to go to, to, they got to go to Jerusalem, to the holy city for Passover. They were in the stream of the tradition as much as you could possibly be. And yet they had, they had wandered away from the father's house from the presence of Christ, from the presence of the Father for three days, three days of time. Um, last night, my girls and I watched um, A Christmas Carol, uh, Scrooge. We watched the only one that is the correct version, which is the George C. Scott version, okay? I'm not, this is not up for debate. You can have Mickey Mouse and the Muppet Christmas Carol. You can have all the other versions. I'm telling you, if it made for TV in 1984. We watched it when I was a kid. We VCR taped it uh, with the commercials. And we watched that tape for years with the IBM commercials in the middle of it. Even after IBM had quit making computers, we're still watching uh, that, that movie. And so I've seen, I can quote that movie. I've seen it like so many times. I love it. But last night, it was so amazing. I was sitting there, sitting by my girls, and Presley was sitting there right by me. And so after Scrooge has this, by the way, I'm sorry, if you haven't seen it, spoiler alert, um, the book was written in the 1800s, so it's really your own fault if you haven't um, heard this story, but Scrooge has a kind of a redemption. And so the next day, the, on Christmas Day, when he's sort of going around and making things right, and he goes to his nephew, Fred, and he, and he accepts this invitation to dinner and he meets his wife and then he kind of puts his arm around him and he says, oh, how much time I've wasted. Oh, how much time I've wasted. And then Presley leaned over to me and she said, that's so neat because that's like the beginning of the movie. And I said, what do you mean? And I didn't, I never noticed this at the beginning Fred had come to invite Scrooge to dinner and he said this to everybody, stop wasting my time. Stop, you're wasting my time. Isn't, isn't it interesting that in our, we, we have this life, you and me, we have these lives and we're given time and we don't want to waste our time. 
on matters that we think are not significant to us. But this is what's profound. I hope I can make this point. Is we can either spend our time that we're given with Christ in the temple, metaphorically, or apart from Christ. Apart from him, we're going to be frustrated. We're going to be in agony. You and I actually can squander the time God's given us when we're living in resentment, when we're living in fear, when we're living in stress and anxiety. You actually get less done, believe it or not, spinning your wheels, trying to manage your time. And then what's so neat is just like Scrooge, just like Jesus' parents, when, you, when, we, when we come back to Christ, when, when we come to that sense of present awareness of the divine, then everything becomes holy. Every moment, all of our time becomes baptized, becomes holy time. Everything becomes sacred. You know, even tying your shoes... <laughs> You know, even making a peanut butter sandwich becomes holy, even changing a diaper <laughs> becomes ho- like this holy, sacred, divine work when there's the same, I mean, that's the thing that's so amazing about the Scrooge story is like, it wasn't even 24 hours later, clock time, but the, but the chasm between him and and loving friendships and joy in his heart was infinite. And yet what was the what was the bridge? What got him back to that present? In recovery, you know, we have these things called uh, sponsors. They're people who guide you through the 12 steps. And I heard of this guy in, in AA who whenever one of his sponsees would call him, he would answer the phone and he would say, surrender's the answer, what's the question? <laughs> Isn't that great? Every time, surrender. <laughs> Oh, have you not surrendered? And I heard of another guy who would, who would uh, when he, someone would complain to him, he'd say, have you prayed about it? And if they started to him or haul or say no, he'd hang up. And after a while, they would learn to pray before they called, you know, because they knew they were going to get hung up on. What bridges that infinite gap between separation and apartness and three days of agony apart from Christ to at home with Christ in the temple, living in joy, living in love, it's the, it's surrender. It's, it's just surrender. How do you surrender? How do you let go of a hot coal? If you had a coal burning in your hand, well, how do I surrender? Just, just do it. Just let go. This year, See, we shouldn't even say this year because that's too far ahead. Today, let's just stay in today. Today, Christ would like to make his home with you and me. And you can either have it or you can miss it. And we're about to sing away in a manger, right? Be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. That's, that's the invitation is to come close to Christ, to draw near to Christ. And he will always draw near to you. He will draw near to you. Jesus spent three days apart as well. So he knows what it's like to experience the agony of separation. Won't you and come today back to Christ? Dear God, thank you so much for 
this Jesus, Lord, thank you so much that even at 12 years old, you were teaching us, asking good questions. Lord, I, we're all in different places. Most of us are tired probably, and hopefully we're going to have some downtime in the next few days as the, the culture kind of slows down this week and, and says goodbye to a year and says hello to a new year. Lord, in this time, however much time we have, help us to not waste it. Help us to to run to you, to draw close to you and see, see that you don't bring joy and light to all of, our, all of our rest. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added to you. Amen. Let's sing together. If you want to come kneel and pray, spend some time with God, dedicate your life again to him, the altar is always.